Okay, so I'm going to start the recording now. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming to tonight's session. My name is Momina, and I am your session coordinator for the night. Today, we are joined by Lucian Wang, who is a LSAT instructor, and I'm going to turn it over to him and let him introduce himself. Go ahead, Lucian. Yeah, <clears throat> so I think my screen should be sharing right now, so everyone should be able to see that. Um, I'm. This is sort of a, I guess there's three main themes that I want to get across and that I'm going to focus on for today. Um, first is just, you know, I do teach LSAT. I've been teaching LSAT for about five years now, um, mostly independent during that time, although I did initially start uh, working with PowerScore for the first year and a half or so. Um, and I just, I guess my LSAT credentials that I've been teaching it for five years uh, with, at this point, probably hundreds of students. And uh, I scored a 174 on my first attempt there, uh, which contributes to sort of the second aspect of things, which is that I uh, am from Toronto. I went to University of Toronto for my undergrad um, and I went to NYU. So for those of you who are interested in potentially going to the States for law school, um, or frankly, just if you're interested in law school at all, I can chat a little bit about just the general admissions process, but also, you know, sort of differences when you go to law school in the States, um, and especially if you're looking to go to a T14 school like NYU, for example. Um, T14 just referring to the top 14 schools in the US. And of course, uh, the last aspect that I think people will be interested in chatting about is just the fact that I am planning or I guess already committed <laughs> to work for a uh, major Manhattan firm of, you know, a, a Manhattan mega firm. So the office in Manhattan for Vincent Elkins is it's only 70 lawyers or so, but nationwide, you're talking about a firm with 700 or so lawyers. Um, and so if you're interested in that kind of corporate work and learning more about like what that is um, and what the sort of day-to-day -day type thing is, I can uh, field questions and we can chat about that as well. Yeah, so I guess, uh, so initially I'm going to go through just a short presentation of a couple of slides that'll set the framework for what is school in the US like, what are the expectations? Um, and we can chat a little bit about LSAT as well. I'm gonna walk you through a couple of problems just to give you a sense of what the test is like. Um, the goal there is not so much like to showcase like this is how I teach, that's not the point at all. It's just to give you a sense of what the test is like, how it's arranged, um, because I know it's kind of overwhelming when you're initially looking at it. And then we can just I prefer a more live Q&A format just to chat about whatever you guys are interested in, frankly. And I think that's a just a good way to shape the discussion going forward. Um, so yeah, that's my biography on the side there. Um, jumping ahead one slide. Okay, so I'm using NYU as uh, my example here because frankly, it's what I know best. Um, NYU admissions, as you imagine, are very competitive. Uh, it's ranked, depending on who you're asking, uh, somewhere around sixth in the United States. Um, you know, the acceptance rate is like 21%, and that's a little misleading because people self-select out, right? Uh, depending on what your GPA and what your LSAT is, you may not even bother submitting an application. Uh, so the median LSAT is 170. The median GPA is a 3.82 on the American 4.3 scale. Um, one important thing to keep in mind, some of you may already know this, some of you may not, but LSAT is a uh, standardized test, which means that uh, 170 basically means you are scoring in the 97th percentile. More or less, it means you have to do better than 90% of 97% of people on test day. Although, as I'll explain later, it's not quite that simple because they scale it before anyone writes the test. NYU is a very diverse class, 33% um, students of color, 53% women, and importantly for, uh, I imagine a lot of people watching this video, only 22% enrolled directly after college, with the average first year student being 25 years old. Um, that puts me on the younger side because I, I am what uh, law students refer to as a KJD, which basically means you went from kindergarten to your JD without any breaks in between. <laughs> So I did enroll uh, directly after uh, college. What's kind of nice about the way the Americans have set up their law school is that you can look up something called ABA standard disclosure. Um, and what that means is that 
the American Bar Association more or less requires every law school from top to bottom to report on data regarding admissions, regarding employment, regarding scholarship amounts, regarding who's attending their schools, how old are they, um, if you want to see good representation, like all of that data is standardized and publicly disclosed. Um, so if you want to know uh, what kind of LSAT and GPA you're going to need to get into Wake Forest, which is a law school, I'm forgetting the exact state, but you can just Google like Wake Forest Law ABA Disclosure and the first result will be its standardized disclosure report, which is a very useful tool because there's something like 200 some law schools in the United States and you want a way to get standard reporting data. I don't have a good way of doing that for Canadian schools. I've tried, um, but Canadian schools aren't required to report anything. And so much less in a standardized way. So when you're looking at Canadian schools, sometimes it's a little tricky, build an Excel chart maybe, but basically you have to like, sometimes they'll report average LSAT, sometimes they report uh, recommended LSAT, sometimes they report like GPA, but it's letter grades instead of number grades. So the, the standardization's just all, all over the place there. Um, but there are fewer schools that you have to consider. Uh, with regards to the schools, US schools are much more expensive. I, and I think everyone here knows this. Um, what I will say is that there are two upsides. One is that private universities like NYU, like most of the ones you have heard of, are uh, because they're private universities, they don't charge international tuition. They just charge one tuition. So there's no like dual fee structure you have to worry about. Um, and the other nice thing is that usually the scholarship amounts are much, much higher. So uh, you can get a lot more of a discount. Uh, I will say the biggest cost for me of being at NYU, well, tuition is a big part of it, but also I, I'm not paying full tuition but the cost of living in New York City is fairly high. Um, so in some ways, I'm actually in Toronto right now just because of COVID. And so that uh, does cut down on my cost of living quite a bit, oddly, um, because I don't have to pay New York City rent. Um, but I didn't, at all of these stats that I'm pulling are from NYU. Some of it's from their website, but most of it honestly is confirmed in their ABA standardized disclosure again. Um, so financing, there's scholarships, of course, and NYU, like most schools, most law schools, does not do conditional scholarships, because you can imagine that if conditional scholarships are stressful in undergrad, if your funding for school is dependent on grades, that is an incredibly stressful thing for law students. And so, of course, uh, NYU has wisely decided that they're not going to do conditional funding, and most law schools in the United States do not either. I know all of this stuff is like NYU specific, but again, it's just meant to show as in like an example of uh, sort of what uh, law school education looks like in the US. Um, and again, you can finance this. Uh, government loans won't get you very far. OSAP does help a little bit, but because it's capped at 7,000, it's not huge. There's bank loans. And actually, although Canadians cannot access US federal loans, there are a handful of schools that will do direct loans for their international students, but they are few and far between, unfortunately. All right, so curriculum. Um, I think Pre-Law Shadowers has a, a number of events coming up this week with law students who are all too happy to discuss sort of what their curriculum looks like. Um, there's a pretty standardized uh, format. So usually in 1L, whether you're in Canada or the United States, you're gonna to have to take a course in sort of basic law, <laughs> um, like the core foundation of legal, of legal study. So stuff like contracts, uh, procedure, procedure is stuff like, you know, what are the stages of a trial? Um, and it's a little more complicated in the US, but we don't have to get into it. Uh, torts, torts, for those of you who aren't aware, is usually what you mean when you say you're gonna sue someone. So if someone, uh, accidentally hit someone else with a car, that's a tort, that's a wrongdoing. Uh, criminal law, of course. Legislation in the regulatory state is what NYU calls it, but this is basically like a government or administrative law course. Um, some schools will also have constitutional law as a first year course. Most of the ones who don't will have it as like a thing you must take before you graduate. And then there's something called lawyering, which is uh, other courts, schools will call it legal methods or legal techniques, just like how do you write a memo. 
and uh, one L elective, meaning you have some freedom. Like you want to, if you're interested in corporate law, you can take get a head start on taking one corporate law course. But your one L year is very, very rigidly structured. And as I was mentioning to Mamina earlier, uh, your two L, your upper years, are basically not structured at all. Your one L year, you have all this rigid rigidity to it, where you have to take these things. Upper year, you know, if you're not interested at all in corporate law, you can go your entire law school career, so to speak, without taking a single course that involves numbers in it besides contracts. Um, but if you are, that could just be everything you do. And the only thing you have to do with you with like public law is constitutional law. Um, and there is, I know you Chicago, I think does not require you to even take constitutional law. And so if all you want to do is sort of do business law stuff, you Chicago will allow you to do that. Um, and this is pretty standard, whether you're in Canada or the United States, you get a lot of freedom in your upper years to take what you're interested in. Um, law, law students don't declare majors. You're just a law student. Um, you don't have to worry about that kind of thing. It's just take what you're interested in. And overall, there's a lot of freedom in how you want to structure and pursue your own legal career, both in terms of the courses you take, but also in your extracurriculars, right? If you're interested in clinics, go do clinics. If you want to do research, there's opportunities for you to do research. If you want to do very little on campus and mostly spend your time biking through Brooklyn, Queens, and uh, Manhattan, you can do that as well, and I can verify that. Um, what is a little unfortunate, though, is the way the grading system works, which is law schools, by and large, do 100% weighted rank ranked grading, meaning there is one exam or one large essay at the end of your course, and that serves as your grade. Uh, there's no homework assignments or anything like that. I've asked the professor why that is, and this is true, by the way, in Canada and the US for the most part. Uh, there's some exceptions where like maybe they'll throw in 10% as participation, or maybe they have like a midterm assignment worth 10%, but by and large, it, it's going to be that final assignment that matters a lot. The reason for that um, is usually because there is no intermediary uh, between the students and the professor, right? Um, I imagine most people here are attended uh, or currently attending Canadian universities. I myself went to University of Toronto. And so, you know, you're talking about like a thousand person class attending what is essentially a TED talk in Con Hall. But uh, in that kind of situation, you have TAs because they're, uh, you know, if you're an undergrad biology student, there are TAs who are masters or PhD students in biology. The, a lot of your professors just have JDs. Um, and frankly, there's no real, like there is LLMs and JSDs, but they're rare and they're not actually like intermediate degrees. They're usually equivalency degrees. Um, so basically someone from outside the United States or who already has a JD in the United States is looking to do a couple of extra courses for a year. Um, but that means that you know, if the professor has to grade all of your assignments, they would very much like to minimize that to one final exam if they can. Um, and so that results, and also there's no good way to do it because the other thing about that final assignment is that it's not, it's not like how much did you memorize like most undergrad exams are. So uh, you know, in studying biology, most of my undergrad exams were how much, how many of these concepts can you remember and can you regurgitate? Law school exams are by default open book. You can bring in all the materials you want. And what it usually ends up being is a almost like a typing race um, where you are given a series of hypotheticals. Each one is three pages long. Uh, you know, John wants to start a business and incorporate in the state of Delaware probably. Um, and is and then after a few years, John decides to sell his business. Please outline all of the tax consequences from the time he started his business throughout the three different transactions we've outlined here and when he dissolves his business and sells it to Mary. That's the kind of exam you're looking at. It's not, you know, what is section 504 of the tax code or uh, what part of the tax code permits a qualified business deduction. Uh, it's not like that at all. It's it's practical problems. It's hypotheticals. And you can bring in all your materials, but you have four hours and you have a lot of material you need to type up and answer. So if you're sort of flipping through your textbook, trying to find the relevant case or statute, you're not going to do very well on that exam. 
And so a lot of effort goes into preparing outlines and organizing that information so that you can quickly access it when it's uh, time to write the exam. It's also sort of usually ranked grading. So what I've posted there is public information. I'm not breaking any rules showing you it. You can Google the NYU law grading scale. Uh, it is probably going to be the first result that comes up. And I worry this might be out of date, so take that with a greatest out. I'm worried this might be from 2018, but I don't think it's changed very much. Um, and you can see, like, unlike a lot of schools, there is a clear and obvious curve, right? They tell you what the curve is. They're happy to tell you what the curve is. Um, and this is only mandatory for first year classes and up your, upper year classes of a certain size. But what this is, is because, you know, when you're writing the kind of exam that I just described earlier, it doesn't make sense to grade students based on like, oh, you got 22 out of 30 correct, you get a B, right? And it, so the scale makes it hard to fail, but it also makes it a little difficult to do well because it's explicitly ranked grading where um, it's almost like mentally you're lining up the 90 papers or so in your head and you're saying, all right, the first nine, they're going to get the A. The next uh, 20 after that, they get the A minus, and then the next 30, they get the B plus, and so on. Employment. So law is weird in the US because it's extremely bifurcated, which is what I want to get across with this chart that I have here. This is from uh, NALP. I forget what it stands for. Do I have that here? Yeah, National Association for Legal Placement. Uh, this is for the class of 2019. And this is the full-time salaries of first-year law, sorry, first-year lawyers right after they graduate. What I want to get across with this is that, you know, you'll hear a lot of information about lawyers, right? Like the average salary is about $100,000. And that is true, just looking at this graph, first year's average salary is $100,000. But if you look at that graph, no one's making $100,000. <laughs> Right? Everyone's either in the peak at 60,000 or they're at the, the spire at 190,000. Um, why does the salary curve look like this? It's two reasons. One, the most of this graph is like all of law. And then that 190,000 is big law, meaning like uh, the major firms, most of which have offices in Manhattan, but maybe headquartered in Chicago, Los Angeles, whatever. So the big major corporate firms. Um, what's a little weird is that all of the corporate firms pay everyone who walks in through the door 190000 and this is just publicly known. Like you can look up, uh, I think I mentioned it on the slide here, Vault data on big, big law salaries. You don't need a special login. You can just Google it. If you Google Vault data, big law salaries, every major law firm is there. Their salary distribution curves for every single year are all going to be there. And really, you only need one because they're all paying the same. Every law firm is paying the same to every law student. Um, there are slight variations in like bonus structure or uh, whether they'll pay for your bar review and how they do that, but that's not a huge difference. Um, and what this is, is basically it's competition in action where like if one particular firm raises their salary to $200,000 next year for first year students, all of them will raise their salary <laughs> to 200,000. And so that price competition is, is very, very public. And so, uh, you can't do this for Canadian firms. Canadian firms, you're going to have to guesstimate. Um, I think U of T Law on their website estimates Canadian sort of Bay Street first year salaries at about 100,000 Canadian. Um, but again, I want to stress that that's just an estimate. You shouldn't take that as gospel. Um, there's no like good data on this because Canadians are more shy, I guess, about sort of talking about salary and that kind of thing. <clears throat> um, of course, there is also a difference in the amount of time you're expected to commit. And this is something that many of you are gonna be interested in. You know, If I go, want to go into Manhattan corporate law, what kind of work-life balance can I expect? Um, and it, it, it's, a, it's a tough one, right? Because the reality is that lawyers are, they work downstream, meaning that like the assignments that come across uh, our desks are gonna be they're not dictated by us. If a client decides on Monday that they want to merge with another company on uh, later this month, we don't get to decide when that's convenient. That just happens. And then we're told that the merger is happening and then we have to handle the processing for that. Um, and so it's not so much that it's like constantly 90 hour weeks. It's more so, you know, sometimes you'll have a 30 hour week and you can go home at 5 p.m. 
or you, occasionally you're going to be told on Friday, hey, cancel your weekend. Uh, Walmart decided they wanted to buy up a grocery chain, right? Um, and then you've got like, you've got to work through the weekend and you're going to look at 90 hour weeks that week. So it's, it's very sort of up and down in that way. And part of it is that like you're expected to, uh, I guess, earn that $190,000. This data is, is very robust, as you can imagine. I, I think it's 19,000 jobs reported in this data. Um, and it, it's, it's good to know sort of what that looks like when you're making a decision about law schools. Because, you know, I was looking at, I wasn't the kind of person who always wanted to go to the US. It was really only after I got my LSAT score and it was very high that I started thinking about the US. Um, and it, it's something that you should be aware of if you're thinking about spending significantly more money to go to the school in the US, you want to know sort of what your return on the investment is going to be. Um, and perhaps that explains why every Canadian law student, sorry, every Canadian student who attends a, an American law school that I've ever met has wanted to go into corporate law because there's a certain amount of you are doing the, the return on investment calculations in your head. Um, I think I just, yes, so NYU law, um, most students are going into firms. Uh, some are going into public interest, government, and like, but on average, most people are going into those big law firms. Um, um, let me double check because I want to. Oh, right. Uh, what I did not mention is that almost all, uh, sorry, not almost all, Americans don't article. So, articling is an eight month process that. Uh, um, that Canadian students and British students, most of the British Commonwealth has to go through where they have to work as student lawyers for eight months after graduation. Not a big fan of it. And I don't think it's a, it's a good thing, frankly, but uh, that's besides the point. So the Americans don't article at all. The moment you graduate, you can start preparing for the bar. Um, and the way this works is, so I just graduated in this summer, I will prepare for the bar. And then after that, I will just, so after I prepare for the bar, I will write the bar in July. I don't get my results until like October. And then there's like a swearing in ceremony in February. However, you start working in September, your title is like law clerk or something. The title is not too relevant because you're, you're making the same salary and you're doing the same work. It's just that like, they can't call you an associate until the February where you're certified. It doesn't matter too much. The point that I'm trying to make here is that they don't article. And so if Americans don't article, that means you're essentially eight months ahead of a Canadian law student, um, which is a huge factor, again, in that return on investment calculation. Um, I think this will come up later on, too. But of course, everyone knows that corporate lawyers have a very high attrition rate, um, and meaning that many people do not stay in corporate law for very long. Now, a lot of this is self-selective. Remember that lawyers, like if the average first year student is 25 years old, the average graduate is 28. Uh, things happen in people's lives, especially around when they're in their 30s, right? They want to settle down, they want to start families, they start thinking about like what they want to do. Um, and so a lot of people are going to decide, you know, maybe three years out of law school, again, the average age would be 31 at that point, that they don't really want to stay in big law and have this sort of up and down schedule the entire time. Um, and so a lot of them will decide to make a gradual exit. And other times it's just the nature of your work as an attorney changes over time. And you may be really good at the stuff you have to do in the first couple of years, but you're not that good at the stuff you have to do in the later years. Or maybe you're a really good attorney, but you're not good at some of the aspects of the job that big law requires of you. Um, and that's not a, it's not a mark against you. It's just, it's just not a good fit at that particular company. I will say like all, everything I've heard from big law is that, you know, regardless of the firm you're at, it's usually like a, a polite landing. Like, it's not like one day you're fired. <laughs> it's more like you have a heads up that, Hey, you're not getting as much work as like here, as you might like. Um, you can see that you're not really the uh, associate of choice for assignments and you can, you know, people will sit, sit you down and say like, Hey, maybe you should look into other stuff. Like they will politely let you know in advance that uh, you don't have too long-term of a future at the firm, which is, you know, it's understandable. And I'm open to that reality for myself. I want to stay in big law as long as possible. Um, I think 
at, I mean, I'm very early on. Maybe I won't like it. But uh, my, I don't have plans to like exit after three years. I think a lot of my colleagues do, and that's fair to them. You know, pay off your student loans, get out. Um, but for myself, like I would be interested in working in, in it uh, for quite a while. And but I'm also realistic, where I'm thinking, put away some of my salary every year to pay off student loans, put it in savings, because it, it's you know it's not a lifestyle that you can realistically expect to last forever. But even if you exit big law, there are sort of comfortable exit opportunities for you. You know, you might go work for a client um, because clients actually have their own in-house teams. So uh, big law attorneys tend to work on like the major events in a company's lifespan. So bankruptcy, uh, merging with another company, buying up a company, opening up a new product line, maybe, or being sued. These are not things that happen every day. But for the day-to-day -day stuff, so like employment contracts, developing uh, employee policy, like just regular things that or like registering trademarks, companies have their own lawyers for that, like in-house. And so you might go work for that. And it's a much more comfortable, like more nine to six job maybe. Um, or you might work for a boutique firm. So a firm that specializes in a particular area of law instead of doing every kind of law. Um, and again, comfortable landing, right? Okay, so hiring. And this is where I think the difference between law school and undergrad is most stark. So, you know, I went to U of T and U of T has, I wanna say 50,000, 60,000 undergrads. It's a big school. Um, law school is not. So NYU has a class of 450 per year and we're considered one of the larger law schools. 450 students per year. And then you're further subdivided into 90. And so the environment honestly feels a lot more like high school than anything else. The reason for that is because like, you know, everybody, um, I did not at U of T because that would be insane. I don't think I knew most people in my program, frankly, let alone the school itself. But, at, at, you know, in law school, you're walking in the same halls, you know, most people, at least in your section or your class, you will all, especially in first year, you all have your classes together because you're all first years and you're all attending the same classes. Um, people say hi to you in the hallways. You're just in like one of two buildings. You're not like rushing across campus to do classes in different buildings. Um, and so it's a very, it's a much more collegial environment. And what's more is the name brand of the school affects your hiring prospects. Um, and this is visible if you look at like employment statistics, right? And I, I wanna be clear, cause I, I'm worried that that can be easily taken out of context. I'm not saying that like these people who go to better schools are better lawyers, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that there are sort of pipelines that are set up where like certain schools have connections with certain firms. Um, and so that makes it easier for their students to attend interviews uh, where, you know, in 1L, you're talking about like there's reception events constantly. Um, the joke that I've heard is that law students at NYU don't need to worry about dinner for every, for basically between January and March because there's always a reception to go to with an open bar and an open buffet uh, or table service, depending on what kind of reception event you're talking about. And these are like very nice restaurants. And so that's like a kind of recruiting pipeline that uh, the firms are not going to be able to offer to every school. As well, the firms want to make sure they maintain a connection with each school and the school wants to maintain, they maintain a connection with every firm. And so, you know, you're encouraged to go to recruiting events. You're given advice about how to conduct yourself for interviews, for resume development. This is a kind of like connection between you and the school that doesn't really exist when you go to a place to can most Canadian universities, frankly. And I'm, I'm picking on U of T because I graduated from there and I can. But I mean, even like a mid-sized Canadian school, you're talking about 20,000 undergrads, right? And so um, the school cannot possibly give every undergrad, like the kind of career development help that a law school can. Um, and so not only are there those reception events, but our hiring doesn't work the way most of the labor force gets hired. Um, so what I've outlined here is basically in the summer prior to your second year, COVID messed this timeline up a bit, but it's likely to return to this in the August prior to your second year. So you've only done one year of law school at this point you do like a three day blitz of interviews. Um, usually, so in our case, it was like, it's at like a hotel, 
they ran out all the conference rooms and then they like essentially book like 10 floors of the suites renovate all the suites tear all the beds and they become interview suites or like hospital or like they have like swag bags there um and then you just go and do like eight to ten interviews a day and it's an incredible opportunity i want to be very clear it's draining but like the ability to meet 30 different firms um and get face time with lawyers from that firm and have the chance to be considered for a position there is really incredible um, but again, it's not something that you can get with every school. And depending on sort of where, uh, what school you go to, you may get a formal EIW like this, you may get on-campus interviews, or you may have to sort of go at your, on your own. Um, and it's a lot more difficult because then you're like sending out resumes and basically you're trying to get hired the way most people get hired for their jobs. Uh, EIW, early interview week, is essentially, you know, it's... If you're here and you're in a commerce program, you're probably already familiar with something similar to this, but it, it's like a closed loop hiring process, right? Um, and then I think of it almost kind of like, like Victorian era dating, where like you meet all these firms like 30 or so over the course of three days. If they like you, they'll invite you back to their offices for like a two hour round of interviews. Um, and then that's how most of us get our jobs. Now, this is just for your second year summer. So, you know, we're not even talking about your final job yet, but usually that second year summer, I think the attrition rate is like, sorry, the, the take up rate is like 95%. So almost everyone who does a second year summer at a firm is hired back after graduation. Because in some sense, the whole point of that summer position is not for you to like generate value to clients. <laughs> the point of that summer position is to introduce you to the firm and to sort of uh, get you familiar, get the firm familiar with you and ensure that like your post-grad transition will be as smooth as possible. And these firm positions pay very well because they they pay you a first year associate salary, but like prorated, right? So it's not like $190,000, it's $3,600 a week. Um, yeah, I think early interview week and the recruiting process I'll be frank, is a big part of why I wanted to go to the US and to NYU. It was to have access to sort of that uh, pipeline for legal recruiting. Um, you know, I'm aware that students who go to uh, really good Canadian schools, so Osgood U of T, um, can also get into New York City jobs. Uh, I wasn't prepared to take the risk that I would be a mediocre student, though. <laughs> so my concern was that if I wasn't an exceptional student, uh, at U of T or Osgood, I would have a much harder time getting the kind of job that I wanted, basically. So I went for a sort of a more sure path and paid for the privilege. Okay. I think I explained this part for the most part. Um, I'll say. Okay, so turning away from law school and admissions and employment and corporate law and all that. Um, LSAT. Uh, this is going to be, I imagine, what a lot of you are considering right now. Not having the ability to pull you makes that a little difficult. But LSAT is a, it's a juggernaut to take on for two reasons. One, it's not a memorization-based test. So, you know, if some of you may have taken a look at the SATs or ACTs. You may have friends who have taken the MCAT or the GRE. A lot of that is, it's not pure memorization, not at all. Uh, but there is stuff to memorize. LSAT, on the other hand, it could be an open book test. And honestly, I think I'd do worse because I'd be trying to like look at the information, <laughs> which wouldn't really be helpful. Like I would waste a lot of time looking at notes that I'd written down. But with LSAT, it's more about like learning how to process information, how to organize it, not about like memorizing legal concepts. In fact, Knowing the law doesn't help you at all. There are, there's, it's not a legal test. It's not like, you know, what statute governs this rule? That's a bar exam. And that's later on to worry about. There's no law on the LSAT. Um, or at least there's no like, there's no more law than there is biology, basically. Like law comes up incidentally. And so your goal with that isn't to like memorize these concepts. It's more like math where you like learn how to use these techniques to solve problems. So um, you want to try and make sure that you write a diagnostic so you have a good sense of what the test looks like. So a diagnostic is just like, go ahead and Google June 2007 LSAT, which is publicly available on 
like on the internet as a PDF. Um, and you just go through some problems. Like it's not, uh, and then you you download that, you write the test under time conditions and you have a sense of sort of where your score would be if you took it that day. Now, chances are it's gonna be a low score just because the next part of this is that it's a, it's a standardized test, which means that the average person on test day should be scoring a 151 and all else being equal, the average person who has done no studying should be scoring lower than a 151. Um, and so the, you know, your, your diagnostic is not going to be determinative. Like it doesn't predict what your ultimate score is going to be like. And also it doesn't, it's just meant to familiarize you with the material, right? So you have a sense of like what a logic game is. Uh, you should also make sure to take a curriculum based approach, which just means, you know, you want to focus on techniques. You don't want to just focus on like burning through questions one after another. Uh, and really ultimately it's sort of about learning the techniques and using the techniques, not looking for those sort of easy outs, right? You don't want to think of it as like, oh, it's a game where I have to find all the keywords. It's really not. Um, and of course you want to manage your expectations. I don't mean like expect a good score. I mean like expect a slow rate of increase. There's only 75 questions on the test now. Every single one of them matters even more because they've cut out 25% uh, of it. Um, 75 questions, that means like each one you get correct is an additional point, give or take a little bit. Um, but that also means that if it's going to be standardized, it means that getting an additional question correct on a practice test takes a lot of effort. Um, and you wanna focus, so if you're scoring at like a 149, you don't wanna think, all right, Tomorrow, I'm going to score at a 160. No, tomorrow, you want to try and score a 151. And then once you've done that, you want to try and score a 152. And then the practice test after that, you want to try to score a 153. I mean, it really is just like a point by point increase to get a little bit better at doing everything at a time. Just because the nature of a standardized test is that it's meant to be difficult. Because if you sort of jump 20, 20 percentiles, right, that means you've jumped over 20% of the people writing the test. Um, I think just in the interest of time, I do want to try and get to some questions from the audience, if it were. Uh, Mamina, do you think that'd be good? I know I've been yeah. talking for um, a we can open up. No, it's okay. We can open up to questions now. Um, I'll start with my question, which is essentially, I was just wondering, because you were a Canadian student who decided to go to an American law school, if you decide to practice in Canada, is that going to hinder you in some way? Because don't American law schools oh. focus on? So there are two things to that. It will hinder me, but not because of the material I studied. So uh, there's, a, there's an old joke for law students, which is that like our classes are different from our exams, which are different from the bar exam, which is different from practice. Um, and the reason is, you know, I, this is a question I get asked sometimes, like, do I have to know all laws of all 50 states? Not only do I not, not have to know the laws of the 50 states, I don't have to know the laws of New York state, except for the bar exam, <laughs> um, because, you know, you practice in a very limited area. But what is a problem is that, like, the uh, Canadian legal authorities, I don't, it's not the government, I don't know what it would be. There are, like, equivalency exams that Americans have to write, where people who attended American law schools, and those can be really burdensome. And also, you might have to article when you come back. So that's, like, a whole other thing that I don't want to do. Um, and, yeah, so that's really the big bear. And this would apply whether you go to law school in the UK or Australia or what have you. Um, oh, and uh, one thing I should mention, just with regards to, like, options to go to law schools in countries where you don't have to write the LSAT, you have to remember that doesn't mean it's easier to get in. It just means they're not using the LSAT. And so like, if your GPA is low, you actually do want an LSAT because the LSAT can boost your, your qualifications, right? If you're doing well, you don't want an LSAT. Um, yeah, but the, to answer your question, Mamina, the, the equivalency exams are really what would be the barrier and maybe like just not having relationships with the firms in Canada. Um, mm -hmm. Manar? I think Manar has a question. I'm not sure what the format for taking questions is here. <laughs> Usually we just have a raise hands function. So yeah, Manar, you can go ahead. Perfect. Hello. Sorry, I am uh, in the car. Oh, there we are. Uh, I didn't want to miss this. Thank you so much, Lucian, for holding this uh, mm. and pre-law uh, shadow society. Thank you so much. I 
I'm actually a student of Lucian and I wanted to say that, you know, only a few, uh, only a few lessons in, I'm learning a lot more about the LSAT than I did. I really want to stress that I did not ask her to say this. Like, I think me. that's important to, <laughs> to mention. Me, but I'm, I'm going to ask for a payment right after this, but he did not pay me. But, um, but yeah, no, it's, it's been great. And I actually have taken the LSAT twice. Uh, so I'm learning a lot despite that, but I did have a question, Lucian, for you. Um, when it comes to specialization, what's your take on like how to approach that? Cause I know that typically when you're doing law school, like you mentioned, there's tort, there's a like corporate law, there's so much that you go through. Is there a certain way that you, or a certain methodology to kind of observe what you like? I mean, when I think of what I want, you know, like immigration law interests me, initially criminal law was really interesting to me. And then corporate law also sounds enticing. What's, what's your, maybe like your, your advice for those of us who haven't really had our hearts set yeah. on something and how to approach it? Yeah, so like I did not study finance and most of my uh, colleagues who are going into like big law and working on finance matters did not study finance at all. Um, some of them did, but it's not a huge advantage because like law is more so about like how you learning how to process the information, just being efficient at it. Uh, and you know, working hard at your job. But the background knowledge isn't super important. And I think firms usually recognize that. I think with smaller firms, they're gonna want to see more like clinical experience in law school, attending the types of classes, getting like volunteering experience, right? Uh, and that's just because they can't afford to spend as much to train you. Uh, but law school is a really good place to, how do I put this, like develop your interests where a, a lot of my classmates did not know they were interested in law from a young age. I knew I wanted to go to law school from like ninth grade, but not everyone does. Um, and I think, you know, you can develop your interest in law school. There's so many opportunities, not just through like career services, but also just through like, uh, volunteering opportunities or even clinics. So clinics, uh, if you're not aware, are basically opportunities to practice law with a supervising attorney for course credit. And so you might take like uh, your semester might mostly be a clinic and then you learn to practice law in that area that you're interested in. Um, and then uh, also career services, whatever school you go to can sort of work with you and say like, all right, you're interested in this subject. Um, here's the people we think you should talk to. And there's like all these events, usually catered, thankfully, um, where like uh, some speaker will come in who practices, say, immigration law, right? Or I don't know, someone working at the UN uh, and will come in and just speak to students for a bit about what they do and what their day-to-day uh, -day looks like. So there's lots of opportunities to sort of develop that over time. Or if you're, you already know what you're interested in, there's lots of events for you to check out and it really is just it runs the whole gamut uh, whatever school you're at okay that's awesome yeah it's reassuring to know that there's still opportunities because it always feels like mm -hmm. you need to know exactly what you're yeah, going most to people do not yeah <laughs> thank you so much again appreciate this yeah thank you lucian for inviting your disciple and paying her to ask that question uh, excuse me i want to explicitly <laughs> disclaim that statement. okay <laughs> um don't sue me um, there's a little question in the chat that I just want to ask you. Mm -hmm. I think you touched on this before, but their question is, <laughs> okay, thank you, Manar. We know you're not paid. The question they're asking is, what Purples. is the vibe of NYU like relative to other T14 schools? And do you think it's more collaborative or the same? I think it's a lot more collaborative. Um, I shouldn't say this when I'm being recorded, but I think like because NYU law students have access to like, really you can do whatever you want to do. If you want to do big law, you can get that job without a stellar GPA. I will say my GPA is not stellar. I am decidedly middle of the pack at NYU. Um, and the way that works is like, you know, if you're interested in a subject, you can find a decent job in that subject. And so that means that we're less likely to compete with one another, right? Not really compete mm -hmm. anyway. Like the difference between an A plus student and a B student at NYU is like you go to a more prestigious firm that pays you the same. Um, whereas to pay, if you're at a different school that might not have all these opportunities, the difference between an A plus student and a B student might be a fundamentally different job where you're kind of locked out of those options. 
Um, and so that can really increase the pressure and it increases like some bad behavior on the part of students. Yeah. Okay. The and also the NYU question, is just a nice place. It's very collaborative. I like NYU quite a bit. Um, it's, it's, I also I, like I the high school one. I mentioned that it was like a high school environment and one of the big things that locked it in for me was that I think one time I was like I missed a couple of classes for a few days and you know if you're at U of T and you, you could miss a semester and no one would notice I missed like a handful of classes because I was being a little lazy coming back from Thanksgiving and I got like messages from people people were stopping me in the hallways Aww. to see if everything was okay because people don't miss classes and people notice when you're when you have missed classes. That's very cute. And I think a lot of us would like the camaraderie mm -hmm. because U of T is kind of crazy. There's like 50,000 students. Yeah, I know I'm a U of T student myself. So the vibe of having a small tight knit law school sounds nice to me. Mm -hmm. um, another question someone had was that, do you think it would be more beneficial to go to a less well known law school per se that is less competitive than NYU because that might make sure your GPA is higher Absolutely because it's less not. competitive. I'm going to say decidedly not, um, you know, without commenting on whether or not that's a good idea for undergrad in law school, I would say decidedly not just because whatever you're gaining in terms of like a, a better GPA, if that's likely, again, you're making a lot of assumptions about how well you're going to do in law school. Um, but whatever benefits you're gaining in terms of like a, a better GPA, you're losing in terms of opportunities that that school might be able to offer you. So like, students at like NYU regularly intern at like the UN, right? Like it's just a different uh, level of what you're able to do uh, depending on what school you go to. And also the legal pipeline that I mentioned will penalize you because if you go to a worse school, you might have stellar grades. And again, I stress that might, but you, you still might end up with like an average job just because you're not employers will look at your resume and they recognize the names of law, of law schools. They care about the names of law schools and that's going to sort of affect where you can end up. So okay, I do not thank recommend you. that strategy. All right. Um, one person here who I think, I apologize. No uh, one person in here is asking specifically, they're working on the logic game section for the LSAT and they wanna know any tips for dealing with curve balls in that section. Uh, prioritize with your games. So don't do the games necessarily in order. Like the first two games you do should be the easier ones. Uh, and then prioritize doing well on the games that you do and worry less about the unusually difficult ones. So the fourth game, whatever it is that is, and, it, and this is assuming you get to the fourth game, you can go very far on the LSAT just doing three quarters of the questions. I will say for my own LSAT, and you know, you can look up, I think it's sep September 2018, I want to say. Um, wait, that doesn't make any sense. September 2016. Yeah, September 2016, like the fourth game there is a rare game type. It's like the virus game. And I missed two questions on it, but I got perfect on the rest of it. And that's why I can do well, because as long as you do uh, well enough on the easier games, you can afford to sort of leave behind points on the more difficult ones. And the, all the points are worth the same, even though it may take more time to get some of the points than others. So it makes sense to prioritize the points that are easy to grab. Um, and then, you know, remain calm through the curveballs because you will be compensated for it. It's a standardized test. So if the fourth game is unusually difficult, games one, two, or three have to be easier or maybe it's just an unusually difficult logic game section and you'll have an easier time on reading comprehension and logical reasoning. Either way, like the test, it, it, it can only go wrong if you let that sort of poison the rest of your time with the LSAT. Okay, I think that's really helpful and especially in the fact that points are worth the same, whether it's a hard game or not. So yeah. just manage your time accordingly. So thank you for that. The next person here is asking, what the process of becoming an in-house lawyer, does it differ from the US to Canada? For example, if you're a Canadian lawyer, lawyer do you stay with big law firms longer than US lawyers would? Some of this stuff I can't, uh, I'm not qualified to answer. So, you know, I can't speculate on whether 
the average Bay Street lawyer stays with their firm longer than the average U.S. lawyer. I will say that uh, anecdotally, in-house positions are easier to come by in the U.S., and this is just because more companies are headquartered in the U.S., um, more, not only are more companies headquartered in the U.S., but even the ones that sort of are splitting their time between Canada and the U.S., their legal teams are often American. Um, and so uh, that pipeline is more clearly set up. Also, for whatever reason, uh, the Americans have developed a habit of like using uh, big law as a training ground for in-house lawyers, whereas in Canada, it's not uncommon to have uh, in-house lawyers developed from the ground up and again, in-house. So it's less like uh, taking people who have left uh, big law and it's more so they, they left law school and they just immediately started working with PepsiCo or something. So that changes the way the, the pipelines work. Okay. And I think the last question that we have for the day is this person is specifically interested in Nomi. How would a Canadian work in the U.S.? For example, you yourself are from Toronto. Oh, if yeah. you wanted to work in the U.S., do you need a work visa? Do you need to get citizenship? Like, how does it it's work? It's surprisingly straightforward. So I will tell you every, and I asked uh, my law school this, they keep track of this, but uh, every law firm in the Vault 100, so like the the top 100 law firms will offer, will sponsor H-1B visas for their students, except for two, which I definitely cannot name, but there are but basically 98 out of 100. Um, even if you didn't get the H-1B, because some of you may know that the H-1B is a lottery, uh, there is a Canadian, there's like a one that comes out of, it's not called NAFTA anymore, but it's NAFTA. There's like a Canadian US treaty thing that like, uh, allows Canadians to work in the U.S. for up to three years. It's a non-immigrant visa. I know this is like kind of dull for some of you, but uh, you know the point is that like you have that option too. So even if you don't get the H-1B, the H-1B is better because it's longer term and it lets you apply for a green card at the same time. But if you know, even worst case scenario, if you don't get that, you can get uh, the other one, the uh, TN visa, basically. And then even if you don't get that. Uh, just being an F like a on a being a visa student in the U.S. gives you like one year of time where you're allowed to work in the U.S. after you graduate. So you have like lots of like multi-layered ways of applying. It's a very smooth immigration process. Um, I will also say like a lot of firms will actually hire another firm, like a firm that specializes in immigration, uh, to handle your immigration matters. Uh, so like. They, they not only are willing to sponsor you, they're willing to like pay the cost basically like and make sure that's a smooth of transition as possible because it's it's part of their sort of talent development, recruitment and management processes. So it, it makes sense for them. Um, I'm okay. happy to stay on for if there's any lingering questions, but uh, I'll leave that up to you guys. I think one person actually just came in late. Sure. So I think for they asked the last question, which is if you desire to go to a certain company in-house, let's say a tech company, for example, should you go to a big law firm that specializes in tech or does that really not matter? That's going to matter somewhat. Um, you know, like the courses you take in law school don't have to be specifically geared towards where you want to practice, but you do want to show some interest. And it's going to matter a lot more once you leave school. Um, most firms, and I don't think I got around to this, unfortunately, it was basically like, al although you can specialize in what you like, when you leave uh, law school, they, the firm will usually ask you, like, what kind of law do you want to do? Um, and I said bankruptcy restructuring work because, you know, it, it did seem interesting and I do enjoy it, but you do kind of have to decide. So, like, if you're primarily working again on bankruptcy restructuring work, it may be hard to shift over to like more patent law, uh, IP types, intellectual property type stuff. Um, and so working with a firm that has a very robust intellectual property practice would probably help you. Uh, being in their San Francisco or LA office might help you quite a bit. Um, and being patent bar eligible will definitely help you. So this is a little tricky, but uh, in the U.S. and Canada, not every lawyer can practice patent law. And so being patent bar eligible, which usually means you have like a chemistry, pharmacology, or uh, engineering degree, that makes it a, you a lot more attractive as a candidate because it means you can handle their patent matters for them. 
Um, I'm happy to handle Serene's question if that's okay. Yeah, I was just going to point it out. Yeah. Um, extracurriculars do matter, but put that in context. And maybe I can address this by talking about personal statements too. Um, every fall, my students kind of freak out over personal statements with understandable reasons, right? It's, uh, it's like, it, I think the reason that people are so concerned about extracurriculars or personal statements especially is that personal statements are the last thing that you can change, right? Because you write those when you submit your application. You do your LSAT usually before you submit your application. And so uh, personal statements get a lot of attention paid to it. But you have to remember, like if you think of it as like one third for each, so one third LSAT, one third GPA, one third soft factors, aka everything else, well, I mean, basically the personal statement or the extracurriculars you're asking about are mixed in with like your work experience, uh, things you actually did, right? And so it, it is going to matter, but you can compensate for it with a higher GPA or better LSAT. But it, um, it can certainly be a way to set yourself apart. So it matters, but not like a huge amount. And what I was saying about personal statements earlier is just that like, however well you, you write it, right? However good you are at constructing the sentences, you're not changing the underlying facts. And so you're talking about a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of impact. Um, so extracurriculars, usually you want to, what I'm saying there is you want to demonstrate that you are an interesting person, right? That you you do stuff at your school besides attend classes. Um, they don't have to be law related. Like I don't, I didn't moot court in undergrad. Uh, I was on pre-law society, but honestly, most of what I talked about in my personal statement and, and honestly, most of where I spent my time was in the lab, which is just, you know, like doing research that is completely unrelated to the law, but that shows certain skills. Like it shows your ability to do project management, to lead a team, to communicate information. Um, I didn't pretend like growing a thousand plants had anything to do with the law. I, 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 what I said was that it, it shows project management skills. So the types of extracurriculars aren't super relevant. Um, I'm, I can handle Ayesha's question next. Yes. Yeah, if Canadian lawyers want to practice, it's easier for a Canadian lawyer to go to the US as far as the requirements are concerned. The requirements for a uh, overseas lawyer to go to the US, as far as I know, and I want to be clear, I'm, I'm worried that I'm leaving out information because obviously I haven't looked super deeply into this, the requirements I think are relatively the same. You have to pass the bar, right? If you went to law school in Canada and you want to go become a New York lawyer, you have to pass the bar of the state of New York and all the other tests besides the bar. But it's the same as like a domestic lawyer would have to. Canada in their infinite wisdom and Ontario have instituted equivalency exams, which people who graduate here in Ontario do not have to write. But people who graduated overseas, even if it is just uh, you know across Niagara Falls, uh, do have to write, um, and that makes it kind of annoying because then you have to study not only for the Ontario bar, which I will happily say is much easier. Um, you not only have to study for the Ontario bar, you have to stand study for the uh, I don't know what it stands it's like N A C whatever um, equivalency exams as well. And uh, the reason I'm saying the Ontario bar is easier, by the way, is just because the Ontario bar is open book and the New York bar is closed book. Oh. Does anyone else have any lingering questions that they might want to ask Lucian before we end the session? I do see a series of thank yous, though. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, Lucian, thank you on behalf of everyone. This was yeah. a really in-depth, very concise and educated look on the LSAT, and I'm sure everyone really appreciated it. So thank you Happy for taking time out of your busy schedule to attend the session and do this for us. I am gonna go ahead and end the recording, but thank you so much for everyone for coming. This is gonna be posted on our YouTube and you can watch it back whenever you want to.